Chapter 4, The Rescue of Will Scarlet. And these will strike for England, and man and maid be free, to foil and spoil the tyrant beneath the greenwood tree. Early the next morning, after he had gathered his band in Sherwood Forest and sworn his great oath with them, Robin Hood sent Will Scarlet and Much, the miller's son, to see what had happened at Locksley Hall. Walking briskly through the forest by many winding paths, all of which were known to Scarlet, they came to the edge of the open parkland, in the middle of which stood the grey stone house with its square tower at one corner made for defence. The morning sun glittered now on the armour and weapons of the sheriff's men who stood guard both on the tower top and at the great door of the hall itself, while outside stood a crowd of poor people amongst whom Scarlet recognized most of those who had tenants or serfs under the Fitzooth family or personal servants at the hall. Now, said Scarlet, when they had watched for some time, I think that without undue danger I might mingle with those who were my fellows and perhaps even do my late master good service. But do you wait here, for you are in danger if any of the sheriff's men see you. So saying, Will Scarlet laid down his bow and arrows beside much, tightened his belt, drew his hood forward so as to shadow his face, and walked quietly out from among the trees. He was greeted in subdued voices by one or two of the yeomen who stood around the door, and soon learned from them that the sheriff and his men were inside taking possession of the place in the name of Prince John and deciding which of Robin's tenants were still to hold their lands. Those who can pay out a good round sum as a present to Prince John, an old yeoman informed Scarlet, may well become tenants to our new master, and better still if they can give the sheriff a gift also, not forgetting Stuart Worman, who has his ear in these matters. Well, said Scarlet, I have no desire to serve any but our true liege lord, King Richard, and under him, Fitzooth of Loxley, or none. But now, I bethink me, I have the hard savings of twenty years' service. Surely these new masters would not rob us of our savings. All but a tithe we might we may take away, good Scathlock, an old man who had been William Fitzooth's groom told him. That tenth part they take as a fine for our faithful service to our true masters, may all the saints bless good Earl Robert and bring him back to his rightful inheritance. Amen, said Will Scarlet, and strode quietly into the house, along the side of the great hall, and so away to the little garret room which had been his. Taking from his pouch a large key, he unlocked a wooden chest which stood there, and from beneath a pile of clothes drew out two leather bags, one large and the other small. The large one he packed carefully with some of the clothes into a bundle. The small one he placed in the pouch from which he had taken the key. Then he walked quietly down the little stone stair in the hall and strove to slip away as unnoticed as he had come. He might have succeeded in this, for no one appeared to be keeping watch at the door if he had not had the misfortune to come into the sunshine just as Sir Guy of Gisborne and his small band of armed men arrived from Fountain's Abbey. Aha, said Sir Guy, what have we here? So please you, my lord, answered Scarlet humbly. I was a servant here for twenty years, and now that my late master is outlawed, I go forth to seek my fortune elsewhere. Well, if you will not stay to serve me, the new master of Locksley, said Sir Guy, I will certainly not strive to keep you against your will. But what have you there? No more than my humble possessions, replied Scarlet, this bundle of clothes with iron cap and hood of chain mail, and here in my pouch ten gold nobles, all that I have saved these many years against my own old age. Oh, pass, pass, cried Sir Guy impatiently. Our quarrel is with Robin Hood the outlaw, not with those who served him as Robert Fitzooth, though I dare say most of them knew of his treason. Thank you, my lord said Scarlet, and slinging the bundle over his shoulder, he strode away towards the bushes, behind which much was hiding. But at that moment, hearing the sounds made by Guy and his followers, Worman, the false steward, came out of the house and saw Scarlet making off with the bundle over his back. Stop that man, he cried. We have not searched his possession, nor has he paid his tithe by way of fine. You do the fellow wrong, said Sir Guy haughtily. The goods are his, only those of Earl Robert are forfeit. Of the traitor Robin Hood, shouted Worman excitedly. Yes, 
Well, how we, how know we that this fellow is not making off with some of his master's possessions? There should be a bag of gold got from the sale of land and jewels worth much gold, neither of which have we found. That alters the case, certainly, said Sir Guy, and turning around, he bade two of his mounted followers ride after Scarlet and bring him back. Scarlet was near the bushes by this time, but he had heard what was happening since Worman had been shouting in his anger and eagerness. Springing into cover, he flung down the bundle, tore it open, and snatched out the bag of money and jewels. Much, he hissed. Guard that with your life and take it to Robin Hood. Say that to save it from his enemies was my last service. Quick, there's no escape for me. Worman will recognize me at once. Do not answer. Run, hide. While he spoke, Scarlet was fastening the bundle again. Now he glanced back through the bushes. No time to run, he muttered to Much. Here, into that hollow tree. Now, silence. Whatever happens. Much scrambled hastily up an elm stump and tumbled with his bag of treasure into the hollow trunk, where he found himself in a nest of young owls. He was only just in time, and Scarlet had not walked more than a dozen paces deeper into the forest when the horseman broke through the bushes, shouting, Stand there, stand! Scarlet turned round and stared in surprise at the men. What would you with me, sirs, he asked. Sir Guy would speak with you again, he was told, and a moment later found himself led back towards the house between the two horses. What would you with me, my lord, he asked humbly of Sir Guy, keeping his face hidden as much as possible from Worman as he spoke. Search that bundle, commanded Sir Guy briefly, and the fellow's clothes. There are but garments and an iron headpiece and a chainmail hood, protested Scarlet, and on me but the bag with my savings, my ten nobles. Hardly earned these tw twenty years and more. If you speak truth, no harm will befall you, said Sir Guy. It is even as he says, declared one of the men, spreading Scarlet's possession out on the ground, old garments and this head armor. Yes, but what has the knave under his cloak, began Worman, and with a sudden movement he pulled off both cloak and hood. Only my ten golden nobles, began Scarlet, holding out the little bag from his pouch to Sir Guy, but Worman had seen his face. It is Will Scathlock, he cried. Seize him. He is a traitor, and he can lead us to the arch traitor's master, Robin Hood. Scarlet's hand flew to the long knife at his belt, but he was surrounded by Sir Guy's men, and two of them had him by the arms before even the blade left the sheath. String him up from the tower top, began Sir Guy, but Worman interposed quickly. Not so, my lord, let him before the sheriff, and then away with him to Nottingham. Let him hang there tomorrow in the market square as a warning to all traitors, and in especial to all who would follow or protect Robin Hood. But before that, let us see if any persuasions will make him lead us to his master's hiding place. There are dungeons at Nottingham, and in them irons that can be heated, and the rack that will pull many a truth out of a stubborn man. I am no traitor, said Will Scarlet in a clean, clear, ringing tones. But you, Wormit, you, the false steward who grew fat upon your master's kindness and then betrayed him, be you aware of the vengeance which just and honorable men will be waiting to bring upon you. As for your irons and racks, you may spare them. Robin Hood ranges in Sherwood Forest. I can tell no more, nor would I if I could. After this, Scarlet was led away into the hall for some semblance of a trial before the sheriff. Then heavily guarded, he was taken to Nottingham and chained there in a dungeon. Much the miller's son missed his way several times as he threaded the narrow paths in the heart of the forest. But it was not long after noon when at last he found himself in the glade by the great tree and poured out his news to Robin Hood after handing him the bag of gold and jewels for which Scarlet had risked so much. When Robin heard all that had happened, he was sorely grieved. He must be rescued, he cried, or I myself will die with him. A rescue, a rescue, shouted the outlaws who had gathered to hear Much's story. Let us march to Nottingham, take the place by storm, and hang the sheriff on his own gallows with Worman beside him. I would willingly hang Worman, said Robin sav savagely, but the sheriff does only his duty in this matter and obeys his master, Prince John. Also at the first hint of an attack, they would withdraw into the castle, hang Will Scarlet before our eyes, and laugh to scorn our attempts at a siege. No, no, force cannot save him, but guile may. Come now, you, William of Goldsboro. You served the sheriff once. Doubtless you still know all those in office, jailers, beadles, and the very hangmen. Later that afternoon, William of Goldsboro set out alone towards Nottingham, dressed in the rough leather jerkin 
and faded hood and hose of a man back from the wars and in search of a job. At earliest dawn next morning, Robin set out with the band, picked from the youngest and strongest of his followers, every man armed with a good broad sword and carrying a long yo bow bow. All of them, however, wore clothes or other wraps which hid their Lincoln green. At the edge of the forest, Robin bade them wait, sending one man forward to bring back news. Before long, he returned in company with an old man, a palmer or pilgrim who had visited the Holy Land, muffled in the long cloak and hood which all such wander wanderers wore. Now tell me, good palmer, said Robin Hood courteously, do you know when and where Will Scathlock or Scarlet is to die? Aye, that I do. The more's the pity, answered the old man. They brought him in last night, said he was one of Robin Hood's men. Him you know as were the Earl of Huntington and helped all poor men. Well, they'll hang Scathlock at noon on the green before the castle, where the maid answer should be. Only today they rear no maypole but a gallows. Rumor of the hanging had gone through Nottingham, and there was a great crowd on the green when, punctually at noon, the castle gates opened and out marched the sheriff at the head of several dozen men at arms. Foremost in the crowd, round the gallows, was an old palmer muffled in a long cloak and hood and leaning on a bow in place of a staff. Eh, he exclaimed in a shrill high voice, here be a fine guard for one man. Do the sheriff expect scuffing, eh? A rescue, eh? There's many here would swing a cudgel or ply a quarter staff, said his neighbor, a yeoman farmer by his looks. If Robin Hood were only here to give a lead, Lord, we all know Will Scathlock, the Earl's man, and many a one knew him as Will Scarlet, who came secretly with food and money for the poor and oppressed. Why, he... Hush, hush, hissed one or two in the crowd. He's speaking. Will's speaking. The sheriff had said something to Scarlet in a low voice, but the reply came in ringing tones. My name is Scathlock, and not Worman. I am no grasping villain who would betray a good and generous master for any bribe that you could offer me. No, not for my life. Robin Hood is in Sherwood Forest. You must seek him there if you would have word with him. Rest assured we shall seek him, growled the sheriff, red with anger. And when we find him, burn out his eyes so that he must grope his way from Locksley to Nottingham to hang beside your rotting bones. There were murmurs from the crowd at this, and the sheriff hastened on to the business in hand. William Scathlock, or Scarlet, outlaw and traitor, the law decrees that you shall here and now be hanged by the neck, and thereafter be left hanging here as a warning to all men. Scarlet looked down at the crowd, and seeing no sign of rescue, turned to the sheriff. My lord sheriff, he said quietly, seeing that I needs must die, and there's no help for it, I beg one last boon of you. Speak on, said the sheriff, it is your right. My noble master, the Earl of Huntington, whom men call Robin Hood, said Scarlet, had never yet one of his servants die by the dishonorable death of hanging. So now I pray you to unbind me, set a sword in my hand, and with you and all your man, men will I fight until you slay me. Not so, answered the sheriff. This I cannot grant. At least, said Scarlet, unbind my hands and bid your men slay with their swords, though I myself have, am weaponless. It cannot be, declared the sheriff. I have sworn to hang you, and even so will I hang your master and all who follow him. That will never be, cried Scarlet, you dastard coward, you faint-hearted peasant slave. If ever my master shall meet with you, be sure he will pay you in full. He scorns such dastards as you and all your coward followers. You and your paid murderers can never overcome bold Robin Hood. Enough of this, shouted the sheriff impatiently. Where is the hangman? Let him do his duty without delay. There was a delay, nevertheless, for the hangman could not be found, and it was at last reported to the sheriff that he lay dead drunk in his room, having found an old friend the night before and caroused with him until sunrise. The sheriff was in a great rage, particularly when he commanded first one and then another of his followers to act as hangman, and each in turn politely but firmly refused. At last, the sheriff turned to the crowd. Will anyone here perform this office of justice, he demanded. He who undertakes it shall have a double fee. The crowd only muttered and growled angrily, and the sheriff was about to bid his men draw their swords and cut Will Scarlet down with them, since there seemed no chance of hanging him when the old palmer suddenly stepped forward. Good master, sheriff, he cried in his shrill, cracked voice. 
I have a grudge against Will Scarlet. Let me have the task of sending him to heaven. Oh, the old devil, murmured several men in the crowd, and others showed signs of holding the palm about. Come on, then, order the sheriff. Stand clear, everyone. Proceed, old man. The palmer came shuffling forward while the crowd heaved and swayed behind him, cursing and muttering and drawing closer and closer to the gallows. Now Scarlet had been brought out on a low cart and left right under the gallows. All that the hangman had to do was to set the noose round his victim's neck, then get down and pull the cart away from beneath him. Slowly and painfully, the palmer scrambled onto the cart, while the curses and threats grew louder round about him, and even a clod or two of earth was hurled in his direction. He fumbled with the rope which secured Scarlet's hands behind his back, then made as if to fit the noose over his head, whispering something to the prisoner as he did so. Suddenly, the palmer handed something from under his cloak to Will Scarlet, who dropped the rope which had bound his hands and stepped forward with a drawn sword held in front of him. Treachery! Help! shouted the sheriff. Down with the villain! But before anyone could stir, Robin Hood had flung off the palmer's cloak, fitted an arrow to his bow, and shouted, Men of Sherwood, freemen of England, save this innocent men from death. Robin Hood! shouted the people. It is the outlawed Earl of Huntingdon, cried the sheriff. There's a great reward for anyone who takes him. Down with him! As he spoke, the string hummed on Robin's bow, and it was the sheriff himself who came down amidst a yell of laughter as the arrow appeared, transfixing his hat. The next arrow I shoot at you, Master Sheriff, said Robin gravely, will be aimed two inches lower. Seize him! gasped the sheriff and his men sprang forward. But as they did so, the Lincoln Green appeared as if by magic among the crowd, as man after man flung off their various disguises, unslung their bows, or drew their swords and ranged themselves around Robin and Scarlet. The men at arms hesitated, and at a sign from Robin, a flight of arrows sped amongst them, wounding not a few. Then they turned and fled, the sheriff setting a good example for speed and escape. Now stay a while, good Master Sheriff, jeered Scarlet. Let me at least thank you for my night's lodging. Stay for now. I will tell you where you may find Robin Hood, whom you will never catch by running in the wrong direction. Let them go, laughed Robin. I'll warrant as we shall meet again, though. Now, my friends, let us pass in peace back to the forest. We mean no harm to any here, save those who would harm us. And if any is to suffer unjustly, some one of you without fear into Sherwood, and there ask for Robin Hood. God bless Robin Hood, Robin Hood forever, shouted the crowd as they made way for the band of outlaws. I thank you, my dear master and friend, said Scarlet as they went along. I did not think to see you here, nor that ever again I should tread the merry greenwood with you and our fellows, and hear again the sweet music of the bowstrings and the woodman's horn.